what happens when something breaks the sound barrier and how can we explain the appearance of loud sonic booms. For more science videos subscribe and hit the bell. We can look at sound as a pressure wave that moves from the sound source spherically in all directions. This wave leads to local pressure differences which create areas with higher and lower pressure. When a sound source with a constant frequency does not move, the wavelength of the sound stays the same in all directions and so does the frequency. When the sound source moves, the wavelength gets shorter in the direction of the movement, which means that the frequency increases, while in the opposite direction the wavelength gets longer and the frequency decreases. This is known as the Doppler effect and to put it simple, it happens because in the time of an oscillation period the sound source moves a certain distance and by doing that the wavelength decreases by the length of this distance which leads to an increase in the frequency. A sound source that moves with the speed of sound is always at the leading edge of the sound waves it produces. These waves pile up in a small area at the source, forming so a shock wave. If a sound source moves faster than sound, it stays always ahead of the sound it produces. On this way, the sound behind the source forms a cone in which it spreads. On the shell of this cone, the sound gets piled up and merged together in a single shock wave, resulting in a high pressure region followed by under pressure. This shock wave starts at the nose of the plane and ends at its tail. At the nose, the pressure suddenly rises to a peak value from which it steadily decreases into a negative pressure. At the tail, the pressure reaches a negative peak, after which it suddenly returns to a normal ambient pressure. Because of its form, this pressure profile is known as N-wave. The loud sonic boom we hear happens when there is a sudden change in pressure. Because of this, we hear two booms, one when the pressure suddenly increases, and the other when it returns to normal pressure. But typically, we don't hear this as a double boom because of the small time difference between the two booms. For supersonic aircrafts, the overpressure of a sonic boom ranges between 50 and 500 Pascal, and the strongest ever recorded sonic boom had a pressure difference of 7000 Pascal. There is a common misconception that a sonic boom just happens in the moment when an aircraft breaks the sound barrier, and never again. In reality, sonic booms are always present whenever an object moves faster than sound. There's just a time delay between the moment you see the aircraft above you and the moment you hear the boom, which probably causes this misconception. This delay happens because the plane moves faster than sound, so you can't hear it before it passes enough away from you, and it depends on the height, speed and flying angle of the plane relative to the observer. For early aircraft, the speed of sound seemed to be an unbreakable barrier because after reaching a certain speed, increasing the power output only resulted in a neglectable speed increase. This was mainly caused by the use of propeller engines, which suffer of a sudden performance decrease as they approach the speed of sound. The sound barrier is indeed hard to break. When approaching the speed of sound after a specific speed, the so-called drag divergence Mach number, the drag coefficient begins to increase rapidly and peaks at about Mach 1 to a value that can be more than 10 times greater than the low speed value. This increase is caused by the formation of shock waves and their interaction with the airflow, while after around Mach 1.2, the drag coefficient is decreasing remarkably, which drastically reduces the overall air drag. To break through this barrier, aircrafts that want to fly supersonic need enough thrust, which they provide with the use of jet engines. Additionally, to reduce the air drag, especially around the Mach 1 area, supersonic designs use shapes with low air resistance, supercritical airfoil, and apply the area rule, which is why supersonic aircrafts often look similar. Generally speaking, supersonic aerodynamics is simpler than subsonic, but the complexity of supersonic aircraft design lays in the fact that they have to be able to fly both subsonic and supersonic. A good example of the problem of combining subsonic and supersonic designs are early propeller aircrafts, which in dive were able to reach a critical Mach number at which the airflow or some point reaches the speed of sound. When this happened, they were unable to properly control the plane and had extreme difficulties to pull out of a dive, which led to numerous crashes. An interesting phenomenon related to supersonic objects is the appearance of vapor cones. When objects move through moist air with a speed smaller than the speed of sound but really close to it, a so-called transonic speed, the temperature drops due to a local pressure decrease, 
and when it falls below the saturation temperature, a visible cloud of condensed water forms in the shape of a cone. One of the first man-made tools that was able to overcome the sound barrier and so to produce a small shock wave was a whip. In fact, with enough swing, the very top of a good constructed whip exceeds the speed of sound and so generates a sonic boom, which explains the characteristic whip sound. Some scientists even believe that dinosaurs like the Brontosaurus were able to break the sound barrier with the top of their tail, producing so a loud sonic boom with which they could scare their enemies away. The way we humans hear makes headphones and music much more dangerous. Test your ears with this video here and see for yourself why you can trust them. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a like.